Welcome to our podcast, Deep Dive, MTR Explores Subsea Technology. I'm your host, Rhonda Meniz, and this is your portal to the latest news on all things subsea technology. This episode is brought to you by the publishers of Marine Technology Reporter, the world's largest circulation publication serving the global scientific, defense, and offshore energy subsea market. For more information, visit marinetechnologynews.com. And welcome everyone to this episode of Deep Dive, Marine Technology Reporter's Deep Dive into Subsea Technology. So I am really excited to be talking with Lee Silvestri today. Lee comes to us, I, and, and she's a busy, busy woman, so I've been haunting her some might say stalking, I prefer not to. Uh, she works at Naval X Northeast Tech Bridge, and she is a wealth of knowledge. Now, listen, if you have new technology or you're a startup or a small business or even a larger business and you're trying to get your technology in front of the DOD, Lee is going to be a wealth of information today. So, I don't know, put the kids in the other room, turn your volume up, and um, we're going to chat now. So, Lee... Thank you, and welcome to Deep Dive. I'm super excited to have you on the show. Thank you, Rhonda. I'm, I'm very happy to be talking with you. Great. Now, um, let me just, I, want, I always like to start out when I'm ta- chatting with people. So can you give us a little bit of an idea of what you do for Naval X um, Northeast Tech Bridge, and then what is Naval X Northeast Tech Bridge, and kind of clue the audience in? Sure. So, Rhonda, if I could step back to what is TechBridge, what is Naval X? Um, we are in the Northeast, one instantiation, one regional presence of Naval X. So, in the later, let's see, around 2019 or so, uh, the Navy decided they really wanted to step up their game in terms of getting the an inroad into industry, insight into what technology companies were doing, and access to technologies, dual use, multiple use applications to try to create an acceleration of not just ideas, but technology insertion, solution insertion into naval mission needs. Recognizing that just like Air Force, just like Army uh, has recognized there are things that are happening in our communities all across the world, certainly in our country, that is steeped in real innovation, real creativity. And there is no need in some cases to reinvent the wheel. Sometimes it's as simple as a small pivot of an application or a technology into a Navy mission need. So Naval X was created. Within the Naval X structure, across the nation, across the Navy, they develop tech bridges. And the concept is there are regional hubs to, in a very good sense of the word, exploit the technologies, the companies, the ideas happening in the various regions and be able to connect those ideas and companies and technologies to naval presence within those regions. One of those regions and one of the first, and there's about 14 or so regions now defined, one of the first was in the Northeast. We have the Naval Undersea Warfare Center here. Right around the Naval Undersea Warfare Center is the Naval War College and Naval Facility Newport and the command schools and an extremely vibrant community of defense companies. So we ended up having a very, very richly resourced, richly outfitted ecosystem of talent, companies, technologies, applications, within the naval arena. So the Northeast Tech Bridge was stood up. In every tech bridge, there is uh, a director, somebody with inside the gates of whatever naval installation is in that region. In our case, Naval Undersea Warfare Center, we have a tech bridge director stood up. The initial person was Steve Bordenaro. He was this incredibly courageous warrior that kind of laid the pioneering for this role for the entire Navy Tech Bridge Network. Uh, today, it, and he has moved on to another role since, today it is Julie Caulfels. I 
in my role have been defined as a counterpart outside the gates. So Julie sits inside the gates badge Navy. By definition, my role, Northeast TechBridge coordinator, is defined to just sit outside the gates, not badge Navy, so that I can do things much more flexibly, much more, more easily than somebody inside the gates badged under Navy rules and regulations. Um, I am funded out of Department of Navy, SBIR, STTR office, Small Business Innovative Resource Office, and it is to work with the communities to connect hands, connect minds with small businesses and entrepreneurs who are doing incredible work, regardless of the industry, with technologies and ideas that the Navy could benefit from and help them get their technologies pointed toward and ultimately applied to naval missions. Sometimes that means helping them out with a mentoring scenario, helping them out with the SBIR program, maybe an OTA, other transaction authority program, or a lot of other things. So that is my role as Northeast Tech Bridge Coordinator outside the gates of the Navy. That's a big role. <laughs> um, it's definitely. <clears throat> Yeah, and, and I'm, that's why you're so busy. Now, so part of part of my day job, I, I wear a lot of hats in the marine technology industry, and I have for decades now, but um, <clears throat> part of what I do is I could do a lot of consulting, and I consult with a bunch of different companies, you know, and I work with startups and small companies. I work with some large companies. I do marketing work, and, and I also do business development work. And, uh, you know, one of the things I think, especially for startups or companies that don't or have not previously worked with the DOD, it seems like a daunting thing to get in front of or to understand how to get your technology in front of the right people. So can you walk us through what that, and I know that the, it would, there's different variables and there's different pathways that you can take. So maybe you could talk us through what that could look like, or if there are different pathways, maybe some different uh, avenues that people can take or companies can take when they want to get their technology. They think they have an application the Navy is going to be interested in. They want to get it in front of them. They don't know where to begin. You know, what do they do? Sure. Um, that's a loaded question because there's a trillion ways. Um, and I'll touch upon some of them, but I'm sure there, is, there will be as many as I don't, or I don't remember to mention as I do. So two things come to mind, partnerships and programs. Um, let me start with the partnerships. There are partnership organizations to the Navy. Uh, the Navy has something they've d defined, um, although there's a lot of partnerships, they have defined these entities called PIA partners, PIA, Partnership Intermediary Agreement Partners. And these are partners, typically nonprofit organizations that work on behalf of the Navy to really coordinate and collaborate um, with Navy needs. In the Northeast here, we have two partners for the Tech Bridge. Um, one is at the University of Rhode Island. Um, under the Euro University of Rhode Island Research Foundation, as you can assume, academia is a huge piece of the, the, the pipeline for technology. The other one is a strategic partner, Senedia, S-E-N-E-D-I-A. Uh, Senedia st stands for traditionally Southeast New England Defense Industry Alliance, but now they're, the acronym stands kind of in and of itself as they have a Northeast and regional presence. It's a membership-based organization of defense companies. Those type of partners that have upwards of a couple of hundred members in defense interested in doing defense work, those partnerships and those organizations are key for a small company that says, hmm, how do I navigate how to get my voice out there, how to amplify it, how to get that greater reach? It could be through academia. It could be through groups like Senedia. It could be groups, for instance, there's manufacturing extension partnerships in every state. Phenomenal partners, not all defense focused, but boy, if there's a manufacturing company that wants to do work in DOD, that type of connection is key. The role I have and the role we play in the Northeast Tech, which we can help navigate those connections. The other piece 
outside of the partnerships are the programs. We have programs designed to help accelerate technology and help advance it and help the technology migrate on its journey into the defense space or the commercial space as well. There are a number of accelerator programs. Mass Challenge has a phenomenal program. Um, Ensign, the National Security uh, Innovation Network under DIU Defense Innovation Unit. They have accelerator programs. There are incubator programs where, uh, like with Sea Ahead and uh, the Blue Swell program, they are looking at taking technologies and helping them advance over the course of a six to eight to 10 week period, whatever it happens to be. Um, there are prize challenges going on. There are demonstrations. There are experimentation events. And again, my role isn't necessarily that I lead all of these, and I certainly don't work for all the partnerships or programs, but I can help businesses navigate the various programs within our ecosystem. Least which to mention, the DOD-related programs and the Navy programs alike, the SBIR STTR program, Small Business Innovative Resource Resources, and the uh, commensurate program that sits in academia. These are um, opportunities that hit three, sometimes four times a year. Uh, last year was four times a year with a bunch of program topics and the invitation to companies to say, hey, do you have a solution? Do you have an idea? It's non-dilutive money. You can come in. It's before you hit the federal acquisition regulation. It's pre-FAR based, F-A-R. Um, it's relatively easy to go after. And once you're in the system, you're in it and you can run with the technology that says, hey, not sure it'll work, but you said you had a need. Here's something. Similarly, um, if let's say there's a, a need for a prototype, there are other transaction authority vehicles right here in the Northeast. We have the Undersea Technology Innovation Consortium led by Molly McGee. Molly McGee is also the executive director of Synedia, as I mentioned. Um, they have pro projects hitting all the time for prototype needs and a company who becomes a member of the consortium can say, hey, I, I think there's one I can go after. Or I think there's one of the big guys in that program, one of the prime contractor system integrators. And I think I have something they could be interested in bringing into one of the large platforms, boats, unmanned platforms, undersea vehicles, submarines, whatever it may be. So I know that's a bunch of just disjointed things, but it is so, our, our, our arena is so plentiful in terms of programs and partners to turn to depending on the specific technology, the need, and the capability at hand. And you mentioned, of course, we're talking about uh, specifically the uh, Northeast area, but you mentioned that there are a number of them, I think you said 14 around the country. So what they would do is they would find their local, if you weren't in the Northeast, they would find their local Naval X tech bridge, you know, but it might say Southeast or, you know, Northwest. Um, but you, that could be a start for them if they're interested in finding out more. But how do, uh, the other question, I guess, is how, um, so they'd have to do some research to, you know, and look up Naval X in and, and, and TechBridge and see what's in their area, I'm, I'm assuming, because I'm sure it's different, or there might be some variations in the different areas. But, but the question I was thinking about is how do, if you're a startup company, specifically, and you've got a technology and you're not quite sure if this is something that the Navy will be interested in, how do you figure that out? Do you just do your research and go and poke around? And is there anywhere that can make it easier for them to figure that out? Or they just have to do the due diligence and poke around and see what's going on? Like, is there any anywhere they can look for what's been, what, what some of the interests are? Because it's got to be different too, I would imagine, geographically. There's got to be, maybe in the Northeast, they might be looking at, some technology that has to do with, you know, uh, submarine warfare, whereas, you know, maybe somewhere else in the country, they may be looking for some other technology that might be slightly different, but their focus is different. Is that, would that be correct or? So due diligence is always great. And any amount of research knowledge always benefits the company. But in addition to that, um, that again is the role I play as the Northeast TechBridge coordinator 
It could be the role the director plays inside the gates to say, hey, there's a, a novel technology that has some amount of stick to you know, in, in integrity to it. It's not just an idea. It's been baked a little bit. And we're going to help find where the most relevant place is in the Navy. And you're right, here in the Northeast, it's a lot about undersea warfare. Certainly surface is present as well, as well as unmanned technologies. But there are various places around the country in the Navy that have various areas of focus, whether they're a tech bridge or not. So the t- we, can, we can help vector them to a more relevant tech bridge, or we can help vector them into an organization that specifically has ad- identified the need. Another really great source of insight is to go into the SBIR, STTR database. So the SBIR, STTR program sits at the government level. The the defense group has, has many of them. The Navy underneath that has many. So companies that say, hey, who's looking for something novel and in what areas? You know, is this, is this, you know, Better mousetrap, something that anybody's looking for. You can go in and you can see a, a history of who's been looking for what, who's been investing in things, who's progressed ideas from a phase one to a phase two, who in the government seems to have this need. The other place is, and I mentioned OTAs, other transaction authorities. Um, we have people all the time, for instance, in the in the undersea arena saying, what are the type of projects that are being looked at and invested in relative to prototyping? You can look at a whole slew of the, the invested projects that have been let out. You don't necessarily know what's coming, but it gives you a good sense of what's there. So there are various ways to go after trying to find insight. Again, organizations like uh, Ensign under DIU, Defense Investigative Unit, are um, certainly well positioned to, um, in addition to their programs, like their incubators, like their accelerators, work with programs to help them kind of identify what's what out there. Um, Also, each state has what used to be called PTACs, Procurement Technical Assistant uh, Groups. Uh, Right now, I believe they're called Apex Accelerators. Well, they are well positioned to help companies understand what's out there, what's in their ecosystem, but what's across DOD. Um, they, they, no, none of these singular places have all the answers, but together you can kind of piece together some a pretty good picture of what's what. As the blue economy grows globally, Marine Technology Reporter has the world's largest audited subsea audience. MTR offers insights and analysis from researchers, innovators, and thought leaders in ocean, subsea commerce, defense, and academia. At MTR, we always stay one step ahead. For more information on how you can stay on the cutting edge, go to www.marinetechnologynews.com. It's interesting. Now, the <clears throat> the other thing that I think comes up a lot too that people often ask, and sometimes when I work with clients that are trying to figure out things like this, um, is the technology readiness level or their TRL. I would imagine that that varies also. Whatever TRL they're at varies based on what they're going after. For example, you mentioned SBIRs, and in some instances, you have to be at a TRL <clears throat> that might be beyond four or five for them to even look at you to um, be able to go after that funding. But then there's others. I would imagine that there it, it varies based on what you're looking at and what you're interested in, what kind of funding you're interested in getting um, when you're looking at trying to find funding as well, because obviously especially startups, you know, they're always on shoestring budgets and trying to get the next, you know, trying to get somebody to help finance some of the R&D to move their technology forward. They might know that they have something that's of value, but they need that funding to get to the next uh, technology readiness level. And I would imagine that that varies as well, depending on what you're looking at. Um, 
So you really must have to kind of, as we were talking earlier, do due diligence and figure out who is not only looking for your kind of technology, but at what, what level you're at so what that it's a proper level, fit, right. what readiness level you're at. Right. Right. So, so even with that, and you are absolutely right, right, Rhonda, but there are various options to look at. For instance, one of the things uh, we do is, so, so in, it, for the most part, we work with companies with a bit more mature technology application. It's not at the concept development phase, except uh, for instance, in Rhode Island, and I know the various regions have different equivalents. In Rhode Island, we have RI Hub. And under RI Hub, we have the Venture Mentoring Services Group. And it would seem like, well, why would anybody, you know, in this arena want to waste their time getting involved with that group where the Venture Mentoring Service are mentoring early stage ventures? Sometimes those ventures have technologies that have tremendous promise for Navy. And this is, in fact, why I personally get involved, because I'm a fellow with, with VMS. And that is because I realized that if you can, if we can work with companies at the very early stage of concept development, very early stage of maturation, and help them understand where there's a naval application where they were not otherwise considering that at all, it could be in the early stages a very small pivot over to that point so that when things are developed out, and they're at the TR level, TRL level that's appropriate for the, for the Navy opportunities, that they will be ready for it then. Now, that's not the majority by any means of what I do personally, but I have found promise within that early stage TRL community. The other place that is very promising are with, again, dual or multiple use technologies, companies that have technologies that in many cases, could be applied, matured, and and grounded in a particular area that has nothing to do with Navy. In our in our region, a lot of it's blue tech ish. Right. However, if you look at the an application specific to Navy, it could be at a much less mature mature level of technology. But the original TRL for for their current application is up there. That's not the same to say I'm still conceiving an idea. That's to say, this application's TRL might not be up there, but we have to recognize that they've done it in a different place, in a different market, different application or domain. And therefore, the effort, if they choose to do so, the effort to pivot over is not the same effort as trying to come up with an idea that's never been explored. Right, right. The groundwork has already been done. Yeah, yeah. Now, that leads me to an interesting <clears throat> question. Let's say someone has a technology as a startup or a small company on the West Coast, but they see an interest or they see um, an avenue of interest for their technology here in the Northeast. Can they apply and contact uh, the correct agencies and get involved in all of the, the things we're talking about? Or do they have to be physically in the Northeast to be able to access that funding and get that mentoring and be involved in those programs and with those work with those organizations? So in most cases, no, they do not need to be in the Northeast. For me to engage with them, um, it co goes both ways. If it's a regional company, I'm going to, by definition, engage with them, and I'm going to help them find a place, even if it's outside of the Northeast. If it's a company that thinks they have an application to something here in the Northeast, I am going to work with them because it would benefit Big Navy, it would benefit our local Navy and our our, our regional missions, if that were the case. So, um, for this program personally, nope, those are not barriers. For some of the smaller programs, though, for instance, um, for the VMS I just mentioned, the Venture Mentoring under RI Hub, the Innovation Hub in Rhode Island, they look for companies that want to either come in and establish a presence in Rhode Island or have a presence in Rhode Island because they're driven, their funding is driven by economic development. My involvement, and this is why I keep it as a volunteer, my involvement is not hinged on that. So I get insight into these great companies and whether they're here in Rhode Island or not, if it's something that benefits our ecosystem and the Navy, I can therefore work with them. 
So that's interesting. <clears throat> so, but now what if it's a Canadian company and they want to come in? Does it have to be a U.S. company? So we have special relationships within the Navy with Canada and with Australia, um, certainly with the U.K. And so depending on the need, the situation, the program, it, it's worth looking into. Certainly we've had technical exchanges. We've had prize challenges. Um, we've done various things with companies that are not grounded here in the U S however, there's always an awareness and they call it ITAR requirement. Um, right. which, you know, the, the traffic and regulation, um, and that's a whole other ball of wax to get through. That's a massive challenge. It is, it is. So for exploration purposes on an unclassified level, um, typically most of the situations I deal with Canadian companies, UK companies, Australian companies, they are welcome in to talk about unclassified ideas. Interesting. <clears throat> I mean, it make, it makes perfect sense because especially if we already have technology, um, exchange relationships with, like you said, Canada and certain other countries that makes sense. And I'm sure there's some restrictions with some con countries, obviously based on, um, especially now what's going on because you see a lot of that, uh, now, and even products that are in, uh, technology here, if it's in, comes from certain countries, you have, you know, you have to be somewhat careful, no. but, um, no. so that's interesting. Now, if, so how would someone, let's say that someone has a technology that, um, they want to get involved in the Northeast, you know, in, in specifically in Naval X Northeast tech bridge, how would they go about that? Phone call, <laughs> yeah. email, email. Yeah. So um, they would contact uh, you or would it, would they, is there. So inquiries come in to the Naval undersea warfare center. Admittedly, they're not really set up to take, you know, cold call inquiries. Um, because of my role sitting outside the gates and the fact that I'm just kind of old, I use the phone a lot, email a lot. <laughs> so people somehow figure out how to reach out and get a connection who has a connection to me or a phone number or whatever. I'm not, I'm not quiet about it. Um, every email I send out has my cell phone number at the bottom. Um, right. It's real easy to get in touch. And again, I, chances are I may not know a lot of the answers, but I can help find them. And I, I work hard at doing it. So I can assure I know you do. And you're that. very well connected. And I know it, it's, and that's part of the reason that I really wanted to talk to you because, you know, I, I've had discussions with people over the years and I know what a challenge it can be if you're not accustomed to working within the Department of Defense or working with the Navy. And there's a lot of companies out there, they just don't know where to start. And it can be daunting. And they might have something they think would be a good application, like you said. <clears throat> Maybe it's not being used for um, a, a maritime or marine application at the, that moment, but then something comes across their desk and they realize, wow, I, I could pivot and this could be an asset, but they don't know how to get there. And especially if they're not involved in blue tech, they just don't know where to start. So I think it's you know really valuable to be able to talk to people like yourself to kind of make you know, people understand in the industry how to, how it works. And even those outside of the industry that might have a product that they can pivot that would work in blue tech or in the, in the Marine industry. So, so one of the things that, you know, the Navy has stood up around as is DOD, they're fair to everybody. And that is a blessing as well as a curse in the sense that it's a blessing that you don't want favoritism. You don't want a good old boy network. You don't want, Hey, this guy's in my backyard, dated my daughter. I'm going to find an opportunity. Right. So the good thing is they are incredibly objective and stand up. And when it comes to dealing with all of industry, no favoritism by definition, my role is to help and I said it in a, in a good sense, use the word exploit, surface, elevate the technologies and capabilities and companies in our region. So is it favoritism for what I view as the strengths of the Northeast? In a sense, yes. But as long as there's groups like mine, tech bridge connections outside the gates, elevating 
and helping industry members along in those regions, then you have it across the network, then it's fair. Um, so I take my job very seriously that I am very passionate about the capability I see in the Northeast. We have a lot to be proud of here, uh, particularly in the blue tech arena. Um, and, the, and the very exciting thing, and Rhonda, I'm, I'm telling you, the movement is incredibly energetic right now. It is the realization that blue tech as a banner encompasses so many industries, including naval and, and maritime missions, but as uh, also many, many other industries as including fisheries, offshore wind, undersea exploration, under this blue tech banner. And of any time in my career, I have never seen such a vibrant time for intersection points across industries, applications, technology areas, customer bases. And you know how we know it's a real thing. The private equity market is paying attention. Right. And similarly, I've never seen in my career such incredible interest, involvement, and investment by the private equity folks in what's going on in, at these intersection points. And it's interesting, uh, myself, those three market segments that you just mentioned, I've worked in all of those and then some in using marine technology in various in various sure. ways. <clears throat> I've worked in the commercial fishing industry, on the science side of things, offshore wind. I've, I've worked with the military. I've worked with scientists in a number of different areas, uh, marine surveillance, you know, uh, mar maritime security. I do work in underwater forensics. So I've worked. So I, I completely agree. And in, in absolutely, I think that people don't understand the breadth and depth, pun intended, of the um, opportunities and in uh, in the market segments of the industry, it's it's really is incredible. And you can have one product that you can have create that or have technology that can apply in multiple market segments in the blue tech industry. It really is remarkable. And it, in the Northeast, I mean, I'm I'm here as well, and so I'm biased in the Northeast. I'm a Yankee through and through, but. I agree. I think we have some of the most exciting things going on here now. And the future of blue tech in the Northeast is off the charts. Absolutely. Oh, the opportunity is limitless. Um, and I look at what academia is doing um, up and down the Northeast corridor. Um, even in our own state, you've got Roger Williams, University of Rhode Island. You've got Brown University, uh, you know, not to say the least, doing phenomenal work right in our own state, even programs coming out of CCRI are really impressive relative to addressing the growing need in the blue tech space. For instance, the overlap between artificial intelligence, augmented reality, unmanned systems with the blue tech movement, um, the, the opportunities are just endless. Um, and again, you go from academia to these uh, uh, programs that help accelerate companies and their ideas to the large system integrators. We have almost all of the large system integrators represented and anchored right here in the Northeast. Some presence here from Raytheon to BAE to L3 Harris. These people are doing really big, impressive things, not to mention shipbuilding, boat building, platform builders. And then you get into the whole innovation community, the vibrant innovation blue tech community. Um, it's just an incredible um host of players and a lot of energy in this space and something to pay attention to. Absolutely. So I guess my parting question to you would be, if you could give um, a startup, it doesn't have to be a startup, but let's say a startup or a new company, they may be pivoting their technology. Maybe they're not a startup, but they're pivoting their technology. If you could give a company or an individual advice breaking into the naval area of uh, blue tech, what would you say? So I'd encourage companies, and because I work a lot with in the VMS program, again, with entrepreneurs, um, there's always urgency. There's never enough time. There's always the need to get money fast and secure, you know, get stable fast. 
I would encourage companies to take a breath, step back, and engage a thought process in terms of the implication of what they're doing. You know, you can take foreign dollars, for instance, and it can it can disqualify you from doing work in certain arenas if that's the case. Or you can take certain investment monies, let's say, that are not non-dilutive, and all of a sudden somebody else is pulling the strings and driving the train. Um, you could do something in the very early stages of development that while you're deadpan focused on one particular market, if you just take a breath, step back, you realize there's a couple of adjacent markets and blue tech space is that great example where if I just did something a little bit different, developed software a little bit different, or my architecture a little bit differently, I can open myself up to those possibilities, not to mention how they structure their business, how they structure their company. There could be a nonprofit portion and a profit portion. There could be a commercial portion and a, and a defense related portion that has certain firewalls and exclusions from the other that will allow them greater flexibility. So there are organizations out there. I mentioned the Apex Accelerator, former PTAC, the MEP, there's the SBDC, Small Business Development Center. There's, uh, again, groups like Synedia. Uh, uh, the, the tech bridges, all who can help think through some of these things. That's great. That's great advice. You are a wealth of knowledge in this area. And I knew that. And that's why I wanted to have you on deep dive. Thank you so much for, for being here with us today, because I think this, no, this, the knowledge you have is so valuable and, and people really oftentimes when they're just dipping a toe, they don't know they don't know what to do or they don't know where to turn. And so um, I, I know this will be really helpful. And um, thank you so, so much for being on Deep Dive today and um, taking the time to chat with us. I know you're a busy woman. My pleasure. My o o Always a pleasure, Rhonda. Thank you. Thank you. This episode of Deep Dive was brought to you by the publishers of Marine Technology Reporter. Interested in being a guest or a sponsor for Deep Dive? For more information about this podcast and many other opportunities for your company to stay informed and in the know, go to marinetechnologynews.com. And as usual, hit like and subscribe anywhere you get your podcast. See you again on the next Deep Dive.